All right. Hi, everyone. How's everybody doing? Okay. To answer the question, do you ever know who Justice Byron White is? He was in the NFL. He was actually an all-pro at Michigan and played in the NFL for a number of years. His name was Byron Wizard White. He was a freshman football player. And, in fact, he would always play basketball at the Supreme Court with the clerks. You know there's actually a basketball court on the top floor of the Supreme Court. It's called the highest court in the land. That's what they, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I played there. It's, 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 but what's funny is um, once the clerks were playing during arguments, and you can actually hear the ball bouncing inside the court. They, they put a stop on that. So to answer the question, uh, Justice White, probably the fastest forward on the, uh, on the court. Let's see. Uh, did anyone go to the museum yet? You really should go. It's a very cool exhibit. I, I enjoyed it very much. Um, it, and you're taking property this semester too, right? They have an entire exhibit on feudal property law, right? And it actually explains it in fairly easy to understand terminology. So if you were totally confused by fee simple and all that other garbage, go to the museum. I, it actually will make a difference. It, it, it clarifies something to my mind as well. I've been teaching this a few times. So go check it out. And the actual magnet card they have is very cool. They have a very nice exhibit. And if you look very closely, you can actually make out words in it, even though it's written in Latin. But a few words like London and others, which you'll be able to make out. So I encourage that you go. All right, questions? Anything on your minds? Anything lingering? Anything bothering you? Okay, everyone knows. The, okay, so the makeup class is Thursday at 4. Next door, room 416. So it's effectively this room. Just one over, so just try and sit in the you know, same seat, just transposed, okay? Uh, let's see. All right. So any any other questions about that? Is that at four I think it's at four. Four is good, yeah? Okay, four it is. All right. And we are effectively building up. This is actually the perfect week to do NFIV versus Bilius to Obamacare case because we're doing all the cases today and on Wednesday that will build up to Obamacare. You will get that case so well, it's going to be, it's going to be a thing of beauty. All right, any other questions before we start? All right, so we are continuing now the scope of federal powers, specifically Commerce Clause. And in the last class, we did a number of cases that trace the uh, what I call an arc of our Commerce Clause jurisprudence. And the reason why I use the word arc is that it's not a straight line, right? In fact, maybe like a sine wave would be a better analogy. We don't have a straight path from one case to the next to the next. With each generation, the Supreme Court makes various modifications and changes to our Supreme Court Commerce Clause jurisprudence. And this is what drives law students crazy. So the only way to get this is to actually understand the development, right? So we start all the way at the beginning with Gibbons versus Ogden. This was the case with the steamboats where New York tried to block steamboats from entering their harbors from out of state. And what did Chief Justice Marshall say in that case? That a state can't regulate interstate commerce, that that is something for the uh, federal government to do. Okay? And Marshall also had this language saying that commerce that's interstate doesn't have to be only within one state. He talks about this intermingling where if you have some commerce that begins in one state and it impacts commerce to another state, that's something that Congress can regulate. Okay, so that was an 1824 case. After Gibbons, we had this long period of these ebbs and flows in um, what commerce meant. So we had the E.C. Knight case. This was a case involving the Antitrust Act. Uh, there, a court drew the distinction between commerce and manufacturing, right? So that meant that the Congress could regulate the actual delivery or shipment of various goods, but they couldn't regulate the manufacturing. And the reason why is that manufacturing was wholly within one state, right? It was only within one state. And then we went to other cases like the lottery ticket case where they said that Congress can prohibit, this is Champion versus Ames, where Congress said they, they can regulate the shipment of lottery tickets through the so-called instrumentalities or channels or, or, frankly, roads of commerce. So if you ship something across state lines, that's okay. And then we have all these other cases involving child labor. This is the Hammer case, where because child labor, again, was within one state, it was only manufacturing, Congress can't regulate that. But this was all building up to 1936. This is this pivotal year in constitutional law where President Roosevelt was swept into power in his second election and had uh, effectively said that his New Deal agenda, his progressive agenda, will not be stopped by the courts. He will push this through no matter what. And the courts, for whatever reason, reacted. And they decided to uphold his progressive agenda. So we had a few cases that really represented a, sh a switch in time that saved nine. Um, I think I mentioned that expression. I didn't explain it. A switch in time that saved nine, the nine justices, right? By changing, by switching an opinion, the court actually saved the entire court. 
if it had not, Roosevelt would have packed it with six more justices and effectively rendered the entire court uh, uh, an arm of his uh, of arm of his political uh, devises. So we had this switch in time to save nine. So what happened? A few things. First case was Jones and Lachlan Seal, and our and, uh, National Labor Relations Board was Jones and Lachlan Seal. That effectively overturned previous cases that said uh, Congress can't regulate manufacturing. This said that commerce is very broad; it includes just about all aspects of commercial activity. So we see this shift from trying to define commerce in a narrow sense to a very broad definition of commerce. And then we go to the big one, United States versus Darby. This is a case that upheld the Fair Labor Standards Act, or the minimum wage. And this case made the same point, that Congress can regulate just about any kind of activity that has some sort of effect on commerce. The Tenth Amendment notwithstanding. And these cases represent a, a, a huge shift in how the court had looked at, at the Commerce Clause. All right? And that brings us up to Wickard. Okay, that's where we are today. Any questions in that kind of summary of those oh, 120 years of case law? No? Okay. So let's, so let's pause for a moment, okay? You can look up. Notes are done. Yes, yes. Yes, question? Yes, ma'am. You said that Darby um, dictates all aspects of commerce, including how they're manufactured, is that what you said? Okay. Yes, commercial activity, yes. Okay, but that brings us to a, the, the point we are now with Wickard, okay? Uh, let's start in the back, Renee. Why is it important in our Constitution that certain powers are given to the federal government and all other powers are reserved to the states? Why is this, why is this significant? Um, yes? So that there is the, uh, Well, good. What is what exactly is that check and balance? Um, I guess maybe it's like the federal government can't really check um, its boundaries outside of the Constitution, allows it, allows what powers it has. Mm -hmm. um, no, you're on the right track, Robert. Why is that an important limitation that the federal government can't? Overstep the boundaries and do things that are traditionally reserved to the state. Why is that significant? Uh, am I, not in the right spot? I don't think you are. What's your name? Chris. Chris, why is it significant? Yeah, everyone, if you're not in the right spot, just come here and, and check your name later. Why is it significant? Because they have a separation of powers. Why is it significant that certain powers are reserved to the federal government and the rest go to the state? Why is that significant by itself? Because it limits the ability for the federal government to do anything. Or it's like it, it, it doesn't, it can't exercise any more power than it was originally. Right, right, no, I know that's what the Constitution says, but why is that the design? Why is it considered a bad thing for the federal government to be able to do whatever it wants in spheres of local activity? Um, well, it's probably like, uh, not as efficient or effective. Well, I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to say that something is good, that it be regulated among the states, having it given to the national be as effective Okay, you're on the right track. Mohammed? Uh, Mohammed. What? Austin. Austin, there's one's up for one seat. So Austin. Um, Why is this considered significant that the states have certain things in the federal government's opinion? What protection does that provide? Uh, tax and tyranny. How? They don't want the, uh, the federal government to gain too much power. They want it to reserve the rights to the state. Good. Good. Joaquin, what happens if the federal government starts intruding on matters reserved solely for the states? It's unconstitutional. Well, I know it's unconstitutional, but why is it a bad thing? They're trying to get away from, like, the government and trying to clean everything. Okay. So, so, so let me ask this question, just, just, just broadly. Has, has anyone voted yet? Please say well, at least one person in this room has voted. Want. Okay. Go vote. It's early voting. I swear, I, I go vote at the Fiesta Mart on Kirby. Like you can go there anytime, seven seven p.m. It's open. It takes you two seconds. Go vote. What's the significance of having local elections, right? What's the significance the significance of having a governor in Austin as opposed to a governor in Washington? Which government is more responsive to the people? Yes. Why is that? That's an easy answer. Why are the local governments more attuned to local issues? Um, well, I would say find it. Okay. 
<clears throat> yes. Yes. Exactly right. Our separation of powers between the state and the federal government isn't just for fun, right? This isn't just because, wow, we think separation of powers is a good idea. Our Constitution represents a deliberate choice that certain things are best done by the local governments and certain things are best done by the national government. Okay? What's best done by the national government? War, right? Treaties, negotiating with foreign countries, making arrangements between different states so some states can't erect trade barriers. Those are things which the federal government is not only given the power to do so, but they're uniquely qualified to do so. What about everything else? Everything else. Which government is better able to deal with this? And the answer is almost always the states. Right? This is the essence of the Tenth Amendment. Do I have it up here? That all powers not delegated to the Constitution, don't have it up here, are reserved to the states. Right? And this isn't some sort of just, you know, philosophical point. This is an important issue that we don't think about today. We don't think about this. Where, I mean, I was taught in school that the federal government could do whatever they want because they're the best to do it. And that's maybe the case in certain cases, but in a lot of cases, it's probably not true. So what the Constitution represents is a wall, right? There's some things that only the states can do. There's some things only the feds can do, right? Which is greater, right? What the states can do, what the feds can do. The answer is what the states can do. This is something we call the police power, right? I mentioned this last class. Every state has a general police power to take various steps to protect the health, safety, welfares, and morals of the people. This is a sovereignty of the states and what they have. The federal government does not have a police power. They've never had it. And every single time the Supreme Court's asked whether they meet it or not, they say there's no police power. Everyone get this? Okay. So what we have in this history, this history going from Gibbons to E.C. Knight to Jones and Laughlin, is a testing of what is the power of the states and what is the power of the feds. And one thing which you may or may not appreciate, and this is the point that Justice Marshall made, is that if something is now in the power of the federal government, the states can no longer do it. Right? If the power to regulate the steamboats is the power of the United States Congress, New York can no longer pass that law. If the power to regulate wages and labor conditions is now the power of the federal government, the states are now incompetent to legislate in that area. Right? If the federal government determines that marijuana is illegal, it's now impossible for the states to make a different judgment on that question, unless you're in Colorado or Washington. We'll get there. Right? When something is given to the federal government, it's taken out of the authority of the states. Because remember, when there's a conflict between a state law and a federal law, the Supremacy Clause says the federal law wins. So by giving power to the federal government, by broadening the scope of commerce, you've now removed the ability of the state to legislate in those areas entirely. Now, I mean, the bad example is, say the federal law bans child labor, right? And the uh, state says, no, we want child labor. <clears throat> if those are conflict, then the federal law wins. And I don't think there's many people in this room would argue that child labor is a good thing. But that might be a law that you like. Might be other laws where federalism, having states have different approaches, might be a good thing. For example, marijuana. Or maybe it's a good idea where certain states might have legalized drugs and other states might not. But by imposing a federal one-size-fits-all solution, there's no diversity among the states, and the states can't choose for themselves how to operate their own uh, uh, budgets, their own uh, uh, criminal laws. So the broader the scope is of federal power, it constrains the, the scope of state power. So even though the state's general police power is really broad, when the feds step in, it makes it more narrow. Even in the Lopez case with shutting, which came from right here in Texas, in San Antonio. Remember? Mr. Lopez was charged under state law with having a gun in school grounds, and then the next day the feds charged him. Right? Texas was perfectly competent to prosecute a person bringing a gun to school, but the feds stepped in. 
Okay. Any questions on that? It's it's not it's not an intuitive thing, uh, an intuitive concept. But as the scope of the federal power increases, the scope of the state power shrinks. And that's something that animates the Lopez decision, the Morrison decision that you'll read about later today. So any questions on that? It's always inverse. If there's a conflict, the supremacy clause says the federal law trumps. If the laws are consistent, say for example, minimum wage, right? The federal government says the minimum wage is $7 an hour, right? And then California says, no, we want the minimum wage to be $10 an hour. There's not really a conflict there because the feds are giving, you know, the state's giving more, so that's fine. What if Texas says, no, we think it would be better for the economy if the minimum wage is $5? And the federal government says, no, it has to be $7. That Texas law would be unconstitutional. Okay? We actually saw this in the immigration context a few years ago in the case of Arizona versus the United States, where um, the United States government has effectively not enforced certain immigration laws. And Arizona said, okay, if you're not going to do it, we are going to do it. We're going to police the border, and we find someone we suspect is not le legally present. We're going to call the feds. You know, this is the stop, show your papers case we heard from a couple years ago. And the court said there are limits on that, that a state can't frustrate federal policy by taking inconsistent actions. So when the federal government has a certain power, the states can't. Now, immigration is an example where the feds should have power. This is something that's within the purview of the federal government, but uh, in many other cases, that's not so clear. Other questions? All right, let's do let's do Wickard. So Wickard uh, v. Filburn is a, is a fun case because the facts are so good. So um, this is actually Roscoe Filburn. Uh, I, I love this picture. Uh, is this an awesome picture? Yeah, this is this is Roscoe Filburn. He was a farmer in Montgomery County, Ohio, um, and he had a farm there. Okay, this is this is the ominous looking Secretary of the Agriculture, Claude Wickard. Um, I love this picture even more because if you look at look at the background, these are all various charts and projections. This says rice, wheat, uh, uh, wheat, rye, and rice, where they're basically having all these projections and the various costs of different fruits and vegetables and commodities to try and set the fixed prices. Okay, so let's let's explain the background of this case. Um, and if you've never taken macroeconomics, this might make absolutely no sense to you. If you have taken macroeconomics, it still makes no sense to you. Okay, but there was a period of time, and still to this day, where there were high, I'm sorry, the food prices were shrinking, right? And only to Franklin Roosevelt is that a bad thing. But when food prices shrink, right, you now have way too much supply because people aren't going, I'm sorry, uh, the food prices were getting a little bit too high, and as a result, you had a lot of excess supply of, of, of wheat, okay? So the government had the genius idea of how do we make sure there's not too low, um, uh, that the farmers aren't getting you know, too low profits. So what they said is, we're going to limit the supply of wheat. Okay? When you limit the supply of something, you shrink the supply, and that makes it more expensive. So this was a way to make farmers get more money. They would shrink the supply of wheat on the market, and therefore prices would go up. Right? So it was considered a bad thing to have too much food, even though there are food shortages. So the way to make the situation better is to make food more expensive. Whatever. Okay, right. It, it, no, it doesn't make sense, but th this was the policy. Okay. So how do they shrink the size of the food supply? Well, that's something called the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. And what did this law do? It would penalize farmers like Mr. Filburn for farming over a certain number of bushels of wheat. I don't even know what a bushel is, but some, some unit of measurement, right? Right? Bushel. So, for, so they would say, okay, you have X number of acres on your farm, okay? That means you can only grow so many bushels of wheat. And if you grow more than X bushels of wheat, okay, we're going to penalize you. Everyone get the basic gist of what this law, so this law worked, okay? So we have Mr. Filburn here, who wasn't interested in following this law, right? So he says, wait a minute, okay? Congress has the power, right, to regulate commerce with the foreign nations and among the several states, interstate commerce. Filburn goes, what I'm doing, that isn't interstate commerce. Jennifer, what was he doing that was not interstate commerce, according to him? 
glad to leave the trip in excess of Yes. Yes. This is what he called his home week. I, I don't know, but home week. He set aside a certain portion of his crops for his personal consumption. He would feed it to his chickens and his cows. Do, do chickens eat wheat? I guess, yeah. He feeds it to his animals and livestock. He feeds it to himself. This wheat would never cross state lines. It would never even leave the farm. It would always remain on his farm. Okay. Every last shred of that wheat stayed on his farm. Okay. So he challenges that the Agricultural Adjustment Act cannot apply to him because he is not engaged in interstate commerce. This wheat was wholly for consumption as own farm. This was a local in character. Okay. All right. So, so this this case represents probably one of the furthest reaches of the <laughs> commerce power. Right. So we're not talking here about child labor, where you know some children are building some furniture and it's being shipped somewhere else. Right. We're not talking about lottery tickets that are being shipped across state lines. We're not even talking about, you know, uh, Jones and Laughlin steel, which was manufacturing steel to be shipped across state lines. All these cases result in some sort of product that will be shipped across state lines, right? But here, this wheat was never, ever, ever, ever going to leave his farm. When even forget Ohio, wouldn't even leave his farm. No part of it was intended to ever leave the farm. All right. So, Stephen, what does the court do here? They they say that it doesn't matter if it doesn't leave the farm, but they can, yeah. because it's still um, because it still impacts the commerce. They Congress has power over it. Okay, that's right. So, what this case represents is a shift in how commerce is understood, and I think Stephen's answer was right on. It's no longer enough for the activity itself to be commercial. But if the effect of the activity is commercial, then Congress can regulate it. Of course, I'd love to. <laughs> And I'll do better. I'll can I type? I was going. You beat me to it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I got you. Don't worry. <laughs> right. So it's no longer enough that the activity itself is commercial. Okay. Now, if the activity has what's called a quote substantial effect on interstate commerce, Congress can regulate it. And I'll explain that for several minutes. I don't know why that's shaking. There we go. <coughs> what does that mean? Am I, can I explain it? Oh. Okay, I'll explain it first. So what does that mean? Oh, I wasn't asking. That was a rhetorical question. Oh, I have a question too. Okay, I'll get to that in a second. So, <laughs> so what happens here, okay? In the past, Every single case we studied involves something somewhere at some point crossing a state line, right? The lottery tickets, right? The boats, the, the, the steamboats, the, uh, the steel in Jones and Laughlin, right? The stuff made by child laborers, right? Something eventually crosses a state line, it uses some sort of road, or has some intersection with, it, with something that will eventually cross the state line. But now, we're looking at conduct that's wholly intrastate, right? I'm going to spell, everyone knows the difference between intrastate and interstate? Intrastate means within one state, intra. Inter means among states. So now even if conduct is wholly intrastate, Congress can regulate it 
if that has some sort of substantial effect on stuff happening outside the state. Okay. Lauren, how does Mr. Filburn's, Farmer Filburn, right, how does Farmer Filburn's decision to grow his own wheat have a substantial effect on interstate commerce? Because he's, like, he's the Agricultural Investment Act is used wanting the, like, government's wanting to take, I guess, more of the wheat growing and him keeping it for himself makes the price go up. I guess that's what I'm saying. Yes, exactly right. So I'm going to caveat that, right? So what you said exactly right. Mr. Filburn's decision, Farmer Filburn's decision to grow his own wheat impacts the interstate wheat market. How? Well, his decision not his decision to put extra wheat, extra supply into the market, will decrease the price. The express purpose of this federal government law is to increase the price of wheat. He is frustrating the government's effort to make wheat more expensive for people during the depression. You can laugh, right? He's frustrating the government's efforts to make wheat more expensive during the Great Depression, during the Dust Bowl. That that that's what he's doing. Okay. Now. He had oh, how many acres, right? Um, Lacey, however many acres he grew. Do you think the number of acres that Mr. Filburn himself grew <coughs> made a, any difference whatsoever in the price of wheat on the market? Why not? Not until he put that into it. Yeah, but let's let's say like he, he withdrew like a couple acres of wheat from the market that should have been there. Do you think that really makes any difference in the interstate price of wheat? Any appreciable difference? That's right. Mr. Filburn by himself, right, the wheat he did not grow, or the wheat he grew, probably makes like an infinitesimally small difference, right? Tiny, teeny tiny difference, right? But that doesn't resolve the case because we have something called aggregation. Angelina, what's aggregation? What does it mean to aggregate? It's not a good, just aggregate. What's the word aggregate mean? Okay. Let's go in the back. Uh, uh, Clay, what's aggregate mean? Yeah, aggregate. Yeah, like combine, right? So it doesn't matter if Mr. Filburn by himself is actually impacting the interstate price of wheat. The court will assume that there are a thousand Mr. Filburns, and they're all ignoring the law. And if 1,000 farmer filaments all ignore the law, then yeah, that will probably have some sort of impact on the interstate uh, market of wheat. This is what's called the aggregation principle, right? By combining together all the possible scenarios in which people might be violating this law, that by itself, taken together, might impact the price of wheat. So even if Mr. Filburn grew, you know, one extra bushel of wheat, just how much is a bushel? Yeah, whatever. He grew one extra bushel of wheat by himself, right? Just one. No one would think that would make a damn difference on the price of wheat. But if there were a million farmer filburns, they each grew their own extra bushel of wheat, right? Okay, that, that, that might make a difference. So the court here is saying is a couple things. One, first we're going to look to substantial effects. Even if you have wholly intrastate conduct, if this will have some sort of substantial effect outside the state, that's fine. But to calculate this effect, we're going to make up a million farmer filaments all breaking the law. We're just gonna, I mean, there's no evidence in the record that anyone else was doing this, but we'll just pretend. All right, we'll just pretend. Everyone get that? Melissa? I guess. Um, the previous few cases that we looked at also talked about the substantial effect thing, so I wasn't quite sure of like how this case differs from those two. Because this case deals clearly with something that never crosses state lines. This applies the substantial effects doctrine. So let's let's use the case of uh, shipping furniture made by child laborers, right? There's actually going to be a record of a manufacturer shipping lots of pieces of furniture across state lines that were made by child labor, right? Here, this is entirely fictional. It's entirely fictional. There's no evidence whatsoever, and there need not be any evidence whatsoever, that people are actually shipping 
all these bushels, right, of wheat across state lines. The court will engage in an exercise of imagination, okay? And I'm not being facetious here. What the court's saying is as long as we can rationalize, you know, conjure up our minds, as long as we can rationalize some reason why this law might have a substantial effect on commerce, then Congress can regulate it entirely. Okay? <coughs> this is something called the rational basis, that's which I mentioned we did the Korematsu. Right? If Congress could have some rationale as to why this is a uh, constitutional court rule hold it. Basically, this is the imagination test. I don't know what a dry gallon is either. This is what's called an imagination test. The courts will make stuff up, they will assume facts not in evidence, and they will try and find a reason why they can uphold this law. And this is done for the reason that courts think that this is for the Congress to decide. And if Congress makes an informed decision as to why this law is constitutional, the court should not stand in the way. Questions? Yes, ma'am. What I kind of got from it was that if they made it okay for him, they'd have to make it okay for everybody. And ultimately, it gets so kind of convoluted that it would be pointless to sort of make that distinction as kind of wrong. Yes. Yeah. So, so basically, what the court's saying here is they're not going to try and make any kind of fine lines. You know, maybe they could draw a fine line between stuff that crosses the state line and stuff that doesn't, but they're not going to do that. They'll just assume that lots of people are doing this. They'll aggregate all these substantial effects, and that's enough for Congress to regulate this sphere. Okay. So the question though begins though, right, uh, Chris? The question that, 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 that emerges is, if Congress can do this, what can't they do? In other words, what's the limit? If Congress is able to regulate wheat that never leaves a farm, what can't they do? Chris, does the court at all address what I might call a limiting principle, if you will. Did, okay. They don't. I mean, they always say, and, and this is something which the, the, the opinions always repeat, that Congress does not have a police power, this general police power to do anything the state can do. They, they always say that. But to never actually identify any teeth, right, any limitation on this, Right? That, that this is exactly correct. Uh, the rational basis of this is just deferring to Congress, that they're not going to be in a position to second guess what Congress does. Right? And, and there, there might be valid reasons for this. It doesn't have to be socialism. This could be the notion that the elected branches are popular. They think that certain things should be regulated. And it's not for the court to make up these kind of arbitrary lines between what is is not commerce. Right? But this, this raises the obvious issue of what can Congress not do. So I think I read during last class was this one quote from an FDR uh, guy who admitted that all the laws they were trying to pass had to torture the Constitution. That was the word he used, torture. Because the Constitution they knew had certain limitations, but they will, did not want to comply with those limitations. Okay. So Wickard is probably the, the widest reach ever of the commerce power of any court ever. And from, I guess it was 1942, over the next, I don't know, 70 years, the court had kind of a topsy-turvy ride from there. So any questions on Wickard? This is, the, this is basically, if you can make up any reason why something might have a substantial effect in interstate commerce, it will. Yes, sir? Say it was the widest up until that point, or the widest. Ever? It would be the widest. I think it's the widest ever. The court never went past that. They might have gotten more narrow, but they never went past Wickard. Right? <laughs> no, it doesn't have to be socialism. But but an interesting point though, in the European Union, which which many people might might describe as a fairly democratic socialist state, they have principles of federalism. There's a notion that member states and their local governments 
are more competent to address certain issues than the national government, right? This is not any particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, libertarian ideology to think that the government, close to the people, governs best. This is something which I think most people w w would agree at some at some fundamental level. But what this does is it implies a one-size-fits-all policy to the entire United States. So let's turn now. Okay, please. Um, so this is all three of the doctrines in one. The substantial effects of national basis. Yeah, if you if you're somewhat confused, the Lopez case summarizes things very well. So we'll we'll really drill down that what they are. Yes. So we just got to go into that detail. Which one about the Lopez? Yeah, I think that's a good that's a good statement. Oh, I think Wickard's still the prevailing test. We'll get there. We'll get there. Wickard's still the good, especially after Raish. So let's talk about civil rights, okay? So one of the interesting applications, though, of Commerce Clause jurisprudence came during the civil rights era, right? Which is something which I don't I don't think anyone in this room was really cognizant of, but this was a this was a very, very significant deal at a early juncture in our history. So let's do this. We haven't done 14th Amendment yet and equal protection. We will do that in some time. But I want to stress one point which you should not forget. Now we all study um, the 14th Amendment. We all study it. And we always study this line, right? You know, the Equal Protection Clause. We all, we all say this in school, right? The government can't treat us differently. They must provide the equal protections of the laws. This is in your Constitution, by the way. You don't need to write this down, okay? But there's one part about the 14th Amendment which we usually don't bother studying, which is this part. No state. Okay? The 14th Amendment and its guarantee of equal protection, whatever that means, only applies to the government. Right? The government is not able to discriminate. Now, we all know that they kind of ignore the 14th Amendment with Plessy versus Ferguson and separate but equal. We'll talk about that later. Right? But by the very text of the Constitution, the 14th Amendment only applies to individuals. Everyone get that, right? So, if you had a private establishment, an opera house or a theater, in the 1880s, and you segregated it, it was not permissible for, for pe people of color, African Americans, to come into the store, right? Was there any constitutional violation there? So the Supreme Court said no. Okay, the Supreme Court said no. They said there's something called the state action doctrine, right? State action. The 14th Amendment only limits action by the state. So if a private business seeks to protect against racial discrimination, if a private business wants to segregate, there's nothing in the Constitution telling them that they can't. Okay. There is points of disagreement with that. I mean, there was actually a dissent, there was a case called the Civil Rights Cases, which we'll say later. And there was actually a dissent by Justice Harlan, John Marshall Harlan, my, one of my icons. And Harlan said that's not accurate, that when you have discrimination in public places and the states are effectively enforcing it, has this work? Well, imagine this, you have a segregated business and an African American walks in. What do you do? You call the police and you ask the Please remove this person. Okay, you've now just involved the state into your segregation. So there are connections between the state and the uh, individual, but that was not the prevailing law. So if the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, does not give Congress the power to regulate places of public accommodation, like hotels and restaurants, where could Congress turn to in the Constitution to get the authority Past civil rights laws. Uh, Dylan, where can Congress turn to, and this is what the Hearts of Atlanta case is about, where can Congress turn to in the Constitution to get the authority 
to eliminate discrimination in places of public accommodation? The Commerce Clause. Good. Why do you think they turn to the Commerce Clause? What do you mean? That's a good answer. Why, why was it easiest? Basically, yeah, um, that, that's exactly right. The Supreme Court had effectively ruled that the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause has no application for places of private business. They, they said that. So where else do they turn to in the Constitution? Well, they turn to whatever they had. They turn to the Commerce Clause. Okay. So there are two primary cases that we'll be studying um, for uh, the uh, the Commerce Clause case. The first one uh, is called Hearts of Atlanta Motel uh, versus United States. Okay, and uh, this is actually a, a brochure of it. Uh, it's actually a, a fairly established hotel. Um, and you can see there's only white people in the picture. Uh, yeah. Um, this is the uh, this is the founder. What's his name? Morton Rolston III. He was an Atlanta lawyer um, who, the second the Civil Rights Act was passed, he went straight to court to challenge its constitutionality. Um, here's another photograph of it. I don't know why there's a boat in the pool. <laughs> I, I, I have no idea. Uh, here's a shot from the outside. Um, and here's some accommodations. They have a, a, a noteworthy, they actually say it's two blocks from downtown, whatever, a, a few blocks from the interstate. That's actually relevant that they advertise that they're near an interstate. Uh, there's no tipping policy. So they don't advertise the no, no African American policy, but that's, I guess that was understood in Atlanta at the time. All right? The other case involves a barbecue in Birmingham, Alabama. This is Ali's barbecue. Um, I love this picture because uh, it shows him just, just this, this is Ali himself, right? And uh, this is a picture of their barbecue. See their logo here? Why is this something really crazy? That's what I bought on, on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a bottle of Ali's barbecue. They're, they're kind of still in business. I have an entire case of this stuff. I don't actually like barbecue sauce, <laughs> but I. I <laughs> I bought an entire case of this stuff. Yeah, you can see my uh, my collection here. <laughs> Actually, it's faded. It's way too much more red. I guess it, 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 it turned color. Anyway, so Ollie's Barbecue was a similar situation. It was a barbecue in Birmingham, and they would not uh, uh, they would not seat African American customers. It's interesting. They actually employed African Americans in the kitchen, uh, but they would not have them in in the uh, in the restaurant area, which uh, you, can, you can make with that whatever you'd like. So both of these businesses. Immediately after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, for a lawsuit. So let's take a look at the Civil Rights Act, which you probably all have heard of. Um, I don't know if you ever actually looked at. There, actually, there were several Civil Rights Act. Um, there's one in 64 and 68. Um, there were a bunch of them. Okay. So the main provision we're talking about is Title II of the Civil Rights Act, and it says, among other things, that uh, all persons shall be entitled to full and equal enjoyment of goods. Blah blah blah. blah. Okay, the keyword here is public accommodations. Okay, so in any place of public accommodation, there cannot be discrimination based on race, color, or religion. Note the word gender does not appear there. We won't get to gender until, until much later. So, what's a place of public accommodation? It's actually defined fairly narrowly. It's not any place private clubs were accepted. That's why you can't have private clubs that discriminate for many more years. It was mostly restaurants, lunch counters, uh, uh, hotels, and, and things of things of that place of that nature. Okay. Now, what is the hook, right? How does Congress try to hook this into the Constitution? This phrase is something we call a jurisdictional hook. Okay, it's mentioned in the Lopez case, but that's what this is what this is. Congress has to say something, right, about commerce. They gotta say something, right? They need to say, here is why we, Congress, have the power to enact this law. Because we have this jurisdictional hook. So as it says, it says, each of the following establishments, blah, 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 if its operations affect commerce. Affects commerce, okay? So we have two cases here. One, in which we have a hotel, right? 
the hotel is fairly fixed. It's not shipping any goods anywhere. Okay? So this case is actually even different than Wickard. Wickard at least involves wheat that may or may not have been sent across state lines. Here, the hotel's fixed in one place. I showed you a picture of it. The swimming pool's not going anywhere, right? It's fixed in one place, so nothing's crossing state lines. The restaurant, likewise, the restaurant's not going anywhere. They don't deliver across state lines. They only serve white customers <laughs> in, in Birmingham. That, that's the extent of their, of, their, of their business, right? All right. So, Evan, why is, let's do, let's do the hotel first, uh, Hearts of Atlanta, right? Why is Hearts of Atlanta, or how does Hearts of Atlanta affect interstate commerce? Good, yeah. Uh, th this is actually mentioned in the brochure, which is why, I don't know if you can see this, but it says a few blocks from all these various interstate highways, right? Why is that significant, Evan? Right. Yeah. Okay. That, that's exactly right. So I mean, th this is might be a, a difficult thing to conceive of, conceive of. But say if you were an African American driving in the South in the 1960s, it might be difficult to stop off spend the night at a hotel, right? They actually had publications that listed the different types of hotels that were accommodated to, to people of color. This was actually a publication you'd have to buy. So the course has a few things. They first say that this impedes the flow of people, which they deem to be commerce, on the roads of the United States, instrumentalities of commerce, because now people can't stop wherever they want. It actually holds up the flow of commerce. Okay. By denying people these equal accommodations, these facilities, they are obstructing commerce. I would see that. Erica, what was in the record to discuss these these burdens on commerce? Okay, the congressional record, that is. The, 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 um, the opinion cites many things that Congress said on this point. I'm sorry, louder? What did commerce what did Congress say about the dangers of discrimination in hotels? Yeah, tell me. What what did the opinion say? No. Susan? What did Congress say about the dangers of discrimination here? This is like a big chunk of the opinion. What, what did they say? What was the danger of discrimination here? Megan? Yeah, yeah, right? So look how they're defining an effect on commerce, right? That this decision to discriminate, to segregate their hotel, might impact the decision of some people to travel across state lines, right? This is the aggregation principle we saw in Wickard, right? It's not that their decision to discriminate might discourage one or two people from traveling across state lines. If every hotel in the South, and this wasn't just the South, it was also the North and the Midwest, it was all over the place, right? If every hotel in the United States would discriminate, would segregate, that would then have substantial impact on the ability of people of color to travel across state lines. They're aggregating one after another after another all the various circumstances in which this law might have an effect on interstate commerce. This is a substantial effect. So, Ryan, 
what about the fact that the owner of the motel, here he is, Mr. Mr. Ralston, right? He says, my hotel is purely local. My hotel does, uh, it, it doesn't move anywhere. How does the court respond to the fact that it's a purely local activity? Louder, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Good. So if people are traveling from out of state, that makes interstate commerce, right? Now, uh, uh, Travis, let's turn to the, the, the Ollie's case, the barbecue case, right? Where the barbecue said, we only deal with people in Birmingham. We don't advertise outside the state. We don't ever deliver outside the state. All of our customers are inside the state. How is this store, then, within the umbrella of uh, uh, interstate commerce? Did you read the other case, the Catton's back case? you got to read the case in the notes, right? You, you have to. I hope everyone read the, the uh, Morris and the Lopez and the Rage case also in the notes. Yes, uh, is that uh, Thomas? <coughs> Okay, these are really important cases. You, you have to read them. Didn't they say everyone has a right to eat? Somebody? Yeah. Where's the food coming from? Um, didn't they have obviously obviously suppliers? Yeah, exactly. Even if you have a restaurant that's wholly within one state, right? It's just manufactured. Yeah. I guarantee that there are ingredients in this sauce that were not from Alabama, right? I, you know, caramel, whatever, right? There, there's ingredients here, lemon juice, right? There's stuff in here that did not come from Alabama. Even if they went to the grocery store and bought some ingredients for their products that came from across state lines, right? That has substantial effect in interstate commerce. Now you might ask yourself, we have this really weird situation. So say you have a local farm. Everyone know what I mean by local food, like these local home growers <laughs> have to grow everything locally? Say you have a local farm, right? They grow their own wheat, they grow their own cows, they grow their own barley. They make all their barbecue sauce inside one state. They make all their ribs inside one state. Can Congress regulate that? Yeah? Yes. Why? Because uh, <laughs> even, even if they make everything locally, there's still out-of-state travelers stopping at that restaurant, and if they're not allowed to eat, that's going to discourage travel. Yeah. So you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Think about this, right? You have Wickard, right? You have Katzenbach, and then you have the Hearts of Atlanta case. Wickard says even if you grow all of your own food locally, that imp impacts interstate commerce because it affects prices in another state. Okay. In the barbecue case, they said, well, but you import your ingredients from out of state. That makes you interstate commerce. So even if the barbecue grew all its ingredients locally, Congress could still regulate that. Why? Because of the same reason Hearts of Atlanta Motel. You might have someone who crosses state lines who now can eat at your restaurant and might be affected. Okay, this is this is like, you know, heads I win, tails you lose. They want to hear that expression? Think about that. Heads I win, tails you lose. Effectively, the courts set up a framework where just about anything can be considered interstate commerce. Just about anything. Wholly local interstate activity, growing wheat on your farm, operating a local um, restaurant, right? All interstate commerce. Now it's difficult for anyone in this room to criticize his opinions. I mean, who doesn't, I mean, you will, you will naturally agree with the result, right? You will support the idea of a Civil Rights Act. You will support the idea of eliminating and eradicating discrimination, right? So it's difficult for us to kind of take ourselves out of the facts of this case. But to appreciate what the court's doing is to look at it kind of in a, a holistic lens, right? What is the court doing? It's effectively giving Congress a general police power, right? That they can do whatever they want. And for about 30 or 40 years, if you had gone to law school in the 70s or the 80s, and you took, and I was teaching a con law 30 years ago, my, my lecture would have ended here. They said, class, Congress can do whatever it wants under the Commerce Clause. The only limit is the political process. Right? That's how my lecture would have ended. I would have told you there are no limits. The court flirted a bit with the Tenth Amendment, but they, they basically ignored that after some time. Okay. So for a period of about 30, 40 years, the Congress had an unlimited power under the Commerce Clause. The only limit was a political process. 
What could Congress get through both houses and passed by the president? Right. That, the only limitation was their imaginations. What what could what could they come up with to uh, regulate? And <laughs> for better or worse, Congress has very big imaginations. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Right, because this is exactly what rational basis review requires. Congress will make up a reason, say, well, even if there's absolutely no evidence of anyone from out of state ever went to Ollie's, right? That at this barbecue they never once had an out of state customer, there could be one, right? And there could be a thousand of them. And that's enough for us to uphold, uphold the statute. The courts will do it like limbo, right? They'll bend over backwards to try and find a way of why the statute can be upheld, and they will do so. I heard a question about uh, another one of the cases that are in the notes, mm -hmm. Perez versus the U.S. Yeah. I just want to make sure I had it right because I, I read over it a couple times. I wasn't sure if I, if I got the, the bottom line of it. Mm -hmm. So because uh, loan sharking was able to give, uh, it's at the second most uh, lucrative uh, revenue stream to the mafia or to organized crime, they were able to consider that impacting the commerce laws because it was financing other crime that was happening across the country? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so what Lopez said, loan sharking. You know what loan sharking is when you have some sort of a local mafia guy, right? Makes a loan to someone at a high interest rate, right? Has that affect interstate commerce? Well, this is used as a mechanism to finance organized crime, therefore interstate commerce. <laughs> but let me ask you a follow-up question, and maybe, maybe um, is that a, uh, Michael? Would Congress even need to say that? Couldn't they just say, we suspect that people who are loan sharks will cross the state border and that's enough? So a lot of this is just kind of a can motions, right? The court has all these various tests and things, but at heart it doesn't matter. Because if you look at the, the trilogy, right, of Wickard and, and uh, Katzenbach and Hearts of Atlanta, there's not much Congress can't do. If it involves something that maybe one day might cross the state line, according to those three cases, Congress can do it. Okay, everyone get that? Questions on, on those cases? We're about to take a pivot to the uh, to the 20th century. All right. So, how many people in this room want to do criminal defense, criminal work? Okay, a sizable chunk. Does anyone know the name Jack Carter? He's a lawyer in San Antonio, federal public defender. Anyone know about him? Okay. You all know the name of Alfonso Lopez, or at least you do now. You should. Okay. This is actually Mr. Lopez. Um, is anyone from San Antonio? Is anyone up at Edison High School? Did you go there? Did anyone go to Edison High School? I actually had a student last year who was a classmate with Abigail Fisher in Jugerland. So that was good. So this is Edison High School. This is the high school where Lopez went to. This is actually his yearbook photo, and someone sent it to me. It's extremely blurry. I apologize. This is the best I can get. Um, yeah, it's not a very good picture. And you see it says Alf Alfonso Lopez right there. And this is uh, Mr. Lopez playing soccer. And the caption reads, um, rushing down the field, Alfonso Lopez warms up before the game. Right? So Mr. Lopez was an 18-year-old high school senior at, at Thomas Edison High School. And then one day he had the, the idea of bringing a loaded 38 uh, uh, to, to, to school. Um, it's not in the opinion, but apparently he threatened someone with it also. Um, that, that didn't make it into the opinion. But I, I read somewhere that he was not a, not a good guy. Um, he's still working there today. I kind of tracked him down, but I was not able to narrow it down exactly, but I think I found him. I, I'm actually writing a book called Constitutional Places and Faces, but all the people in these Supreme Court cases, that's why I have all these pictures. I'm, I'm accumulating them for a book. But we all know about Mr. Lopez, right? What's that? We all know about Mr. Lopez, <laughs> but we don't know about his lawyer. His lawyer's name is Jack Carter, who's a federal public defender. Um, I actually emailed him. He never heard back from him. I was so sad. But why is Jack Carter the reason why con law is so important, okay? Because he was representing his guy on a charge that he was dead to right. He was guilty, right? He brought the gun to school. There was no question. So what did Mr. Carter say for Mr. Lopez? He said, Your Honor, Congress does not have the ability to criminalize the possession of a gun in a school zone. He said Congress doesn't have the Commerce Clause authority to ban possessions of guns in school zones. I'm sure everyone at his office laughed at him. I'm sure his constitutional law professor 
would have laughed at him. <coughs> because at the time, every single scholar would say, of course Congress can regulate this, right? It's a, that's a piece of cake, right? Where did that gun come from? The gun came from another state. Where was it manufactured? I don't know. You know, where did the bullets come from? Out of state. Where did the lead come from? I'm sure that someone who went to Thomas Edison High School is from Tennessee or something. Maybe he crossed the state line, right? <laughs> Under the prevailing wisdom at the time, this law was so clearly constitutional that Congress got lazy. They got lazy. Remember I explained the jurisdictional hook. This was in the, um, this was the Civil Rights Act, right? And they put in one sentence, right? That's really all they needed. It says that discrimination in places of public accommodations can affect commerce. Right? In the Gun-Free School Zone Act of 1990, they got lazy. They did not put in a jurisdictional hook. They didn't just say, oh yeah, guns, commerce, whatever, right? They didn't even do that. In the Gun-Free School Zone case, I'm sorry, the Gun-Free School Zone Act of 1990, Congress made absolutely no reference whatsoever to how this law affects interstate commerce. Zero. And you have a really smart lawyer, who none of you have ever heard of, Jack Carter, who did his homework. And he said, wait a minute. I remember in school when my professor told me that, 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 that you know, Congress can do anything that affects commerce, but this statute's silent on that point, right? This is why any of you want to do criminal law, this is important stuff. This, 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 these cases change constitutional law, right? Because you had some, some really smart lawyer in San Antonio, probably did a really high docket, had some poor 18-year-old kid who couldn't afford a lawyer, and he changed constitutional law. This is how these things work. You know, I'll talk about the Obamacare case in a few days, but this was a case that was born out of haste. We had basically a lot of people come up with ideas very quickly. And where was the key argument found? In a student law review note from the Case Western Law Review, where one student wrote an article about why Congress can't regulate activity. And that one article found the entire basis for the Obamacare lawsuit, right? That was it. So always remember this stuff, no matter what, what practice you're in, especially in criminal law. So we go to 1995 and the case of United States versus uh, Lopez. And we, we consider whether Congress has the power to regulate guns in a school zone. So before we go there, right, and this is not in any way a, a discussion of the Second Amendment. I don't even want to go there yet. But um, Aaron, say for example, is that Aaron? Okay. Aaron, say for example that Texas decided that it would be a wise idea to let people with concealed carry permits carry a firearm in a school zone. It's just, I mean, that, that may or may not happen, right? And there's a federal act of Congress that says no guns allowed in a school zone. What would happen to that federal to that to that state law? The federal law would override the state law. Okay, so you see here how you have this conflict, right? There's differing opinions on perhaps how to promote school safety, and I don't I don't even want to have that debate, right? Texas may decide it's better to allow people with concealed carry permits to bring guns into schools. Okay, agree or disagree doesn't really matter. Feds say no, we think not. So that one federal policy would trump all 50 states. This is the sense in which federal law can displace state law. Okay? But that's not the case here. The case here is that Texas also had a law banning guns in school zones, right? Uh, uh, Barrett, was there anything disqualifying Texas from uh, bringing a prosecution against Mr. Lopez? No. Did they actually do it? They did, and then, and then what happened? The Fed, what's that mean when the Feds step in? We always see that on TV. Oh, the, the, Fed, the Feds took over this investigation, right? What does that mean the Feds took over? Uh, well, think about it. So, so here's how it goes, right? And if you've ever done any clerking for a judge in a state court, this is how it goes down, okay? When the feds step in, that means it's one less case that an overburdened state prosecutor has to work with, right? That's one less case that the state, the Texas Bureau of Prisons has to incarcerate someone, right? It's one less problem for the states to worry about. So very often the states love when the feds step in. And what also happens? Stiffer penalties. I haven't researched this. I'm pretty sure if you have a gun in a school zone in Texas, that's probably a misdemeanor, right? I mean, you might get, you'll get a slap on the wrist, right? I mean, it won't be very significant. I, I, I don't know, but I'm just guessing here, okay? If you have a gun in a school zone, 
under federal law, you are now a felon, right? You will go to jail for a very long time. You will be disqualified from a host of rights. You can't vote. You can't own a gun. There's a lot of consequences of being a federal felon, okay? So when the feds step in, when they step in, this is a big, significant deal. Um, this is actually a case right now going on out of Harris County uh, with a federal hate crime act, right? So what, what, what's a federal hate crime? Well, it, it's some crime motivated by some sort of racial animus, okay? Now, usually, if someone beats someone up based on racial animus, they bring charges under state battery law. Like they committed a battery. And that's usually a misdemeanor at best. You go to jail for maybe a couple months, okay? But under the federal law, you can go to jail for several years for a battery because it's not motivated by race. And there's actually a challenge pending in the Fifth Circuit. I saw the arguments just like you know, a few blocks away saying, does Congress have the power to regulate these hate crimes? Are they displacing something which was traditionally the function of the states? Say the state of Texas doesn't want to punish these crimes as severely. Can the feds force it upon them? So this is a live issue um, in many respects. So we have Mr. Lopez. He brings his gun to school. Okay. His very bright lawyer says, Your Honor, Congress doesn't have the power to do this. You want to know what? The Fifth Circuit says, We agree. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, based in Louisiana, which hears appeals from Texas, says, Congress can't do this. Okay. This teed up the Supreme Court case. All right? So, uh, uh, Jermaine, what did, what did the court hold here? Can Congress regulate this activity? of keeping a gun within a school zone? Why not? What was lacking in the statute that Congress passed to make this constitutional? What did Congress not do that they should have done to make this thing constitutional? See, uh, you got it? Gerardo? Was it that uh, possession of a firearm in school doesn't affect interstate commerce? Yes. What well, Congress failed to, like I said, they got lazy. Right? They got lazy. They nowhere explained how or why possessing a firearm on school grounds will affect interstate commerce. What's actually really funny, and I don't know if any of you noticed the, the footnote, is that in 1994, right, four years after the law was passed, the Congress, which was then controlled by Democrats, uh, passed a law effectively saying, oh, let's amend this statute, right? <laughs> and let's pretend that we, we thought back then that this affects commerce. They effectively changed the statute four years later to add all these findings about how this affects interstate commerce. They were trying to change the law so it wouldn't get struck down. Right? The law had already been struck down by the Court of Appeals. They were trying to amend the law four years after the fact. Change it. Does the, is the majority persuaded by that? Yeah? You? Yeah? Uh, no. Why not? Why do you think not, if you don't know? Well, I don't know. I can... Like venture, I guess, but yeah, venture, I guess. Um, why, why should it make no difference if they change law four years after it's passed? Think about it. You're going to be a criminal lawyer soon. No, I'm not. Hopefully, you get, just, uh, did, no, no criminal law in Canada? No. no. <laughs> Think about it. What law was he prosecuted under? How does the law exist at the time of his prosecution? Oh. Wouldn't it be ex post facto if they changed it? Kind of, yeah. In other words, they tried to be cute. They tried to change the law after the fact to uphold it, but he was already convicted under an older version of the law, right? It's not exactly ex post facto, but it's pretty close. You can't change the law after the fact. And it's, it's a broader point, right? When a certain Congress passes a law, they have certain intents and certain thoughts, right? We can't expect later Congresses to impact what an earlier Congress did, right? So actually, Justice Breyer cites that in the dissent, but that's Justice Breyer. But the majority says we're not going to rely on this. We're not going to rely on these post-enactment statements, okay? But that raises a, a different question, right? Uh, Christine, what would have happened 
alternate universe, right? If Congress had inserted the word commerce into the statute, they just slapped on the word commerce. With love and a pelt, they, they, they just added this exact sentence that guns and school zones affects commerce. They just said that and nothing else. Would that have been enough to pull the statute? It's not prior yet. Right. Had the court, had Congress not been lazy here, right? <coughs> had they just insert, inserted the words affects interstate commerce, would the courts have upheld it? Probably. Okay? So this raises what's often called the magic words test of constitutional law. You know, did Congress say abracadabra commerce, right? Did they use the magic words to say this affects commerce? All right? And if that's the answer, if all it takes for Congress to pull the statute is to add the words affects commerce, then what are we doing here? Right? Why do we have, why, this is not a problem. Congress just gets smart in later cases and says, blah, 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 guns, commerce, blah, blah, blah. Right? Wouldn't that be enough? Mm -hmm. Melissa, is that not enough? It would be because they're using this, the rational basis test to look at these things and as long as there's some possible reason. So is Congress, I'm sorry, under this rational basis test, as you said, will the court scrutinize when Congress says blah, 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 commerce, blah, blah, blah? That's correct. Under the rational basis test, courts are not going to scrutinize or look closely at when the, when the, when the Congress says blah, 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 commerce. They won't even look at it. But what's so significant about Lopez is that they're not applying a rational basis test. They might pretend to be, but they're not. And I'll walk you through the significance of this. So Chief Justice Rehnquist begins, quote, we start with first principles. Okay. He's not just repeating what the New Deal court said in Wickard or what the Warren court said in Katzenbach or, or Hearts of Atlanta Motel. He's starting from first principles. He goes back to our buddy James Madison in Federalist 45, talking about the importance of separating powers between the state and the federal government. And he said, this division, quote, ensures protection of our fundamental liberties, that by keeping government close to the people, you're actually protecting the freedoms of the people. And I think someone says before, but the balance between the state and the federal government reduces the risk of, quote, tyranny and abuse. He walks through the evolution of doctrine from Gibbons v. Ogden, to the New Deal, to E.C. Knight, okay? And he notes and he acknowledges that the doctrine hasn't progressed along a straight line. And there's a, there's a wonderful um, history. If you want to if you, if you're outline uh, a, a good summary of the case law from the last hundred years, just, just copy from Chief Justice Rehnquist's opinion. It's quite good, right? So he walks through them. We have the E.C. Knight case, right? There the court held that commerce is after manufacturing, that commerce is not actually producing something, right? We have the Carter Coal case. This is about mining. That mining was not commerce because it did not involve transportation. We have the Schecht to Poultry case. This is where the court struck down a regulation because it only had an indirect effect in interstate commerce, right? So these are the first range of cases where the courts would actually scrutinize We'll look closely at what Congress is doing. But then we have the shift, the switch in time that saved nine. Talks about Jones and Lachlan Steel, the, 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 uh, the NLR, NLRB case, where they get rid of this distinction between direct and indirect. Okay? So now we have is the court are not really looking closely at what Congress is actually doing. As long as they say the magic words, abracadabra commerce, right? It's enough. Darby the same. And then in Wickard. If you aggregate together all the possible uh, uh, people uh, growing wheat locally, it will have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Rehnquist says that enterprises that had once been local or regional had now become national. Okay? But he also says something interesting. He says there was a doctrinal change at the New Deal. And the notion that the Commerce Clause Authority 
was restraining the ability of Congress to act. And this was really the key. The Constitution was getting in the way of the President, right? There's no other way to say it. The Constitution was getting in the way of the ability of Congress and the President to enact progressive legislation. Congress was not confident that the states would enact these laws, so he imposed the one-size-fits-all federal solution. And some of you might be wincing your head thinking that it's a stupid law telling you know, farmers that they can't grow wheat, but the same authority was then used to tell hotels and restaurants that they can't discriminate. Okay? But we have these precedents, and one thing I want you to stress is that the Lopez case and the cases that came in the 90s did not reverse Wickard. They did not overturn the New Deal. What these cases represent is the idea that Wickard is the outer limit Right? That there is some outer limit beyond which Congress can't go. Right? Wickard is the furthest stretch of the exercise of power. A product that never, ever, ever, ever will leave the state can have a substantial effect in commerce. That's as far as Congress ever went. And what Rehnquist says is we will not go further than that. We can't eliminate this distinction. In other words, we need to put some sort of teeth, something strong in this to mark the outer bounds. So everyone get that. The New Deal represents the outermost limits of what Congress can do. But the 1990s, a period that was known as the Federalism Revolution, or the Rehnquist Revolution, it's called both things, Federalism Revolution or Rehnquist Revolution, this represents the court saying, okay, we went this far, but that's it. We're not going further than this. And if you want to request new exercises of federal power, you have to check with us first. Right? In other words, this far, but no farther. We went this far in the, in the New Deal, but we will not go further unless you can meet the Constitution. This, is, this, this will help make Obamacare a lot more sense. Blah. This will help Obamacare make a lot more sense. It didn't fit under any of the rules of the New Deal. It was trying to do something novel, something, dare I say, unprecedented. Right? That's what that word means. Congress had never tried this before. And because it was unprecedented, it was not going to be governed under Wickard. You'll, you'll get there this week, I promise, but we'll be building up to that like a crescendo. All right? Everyone get that. This is a point that most people don't appreciate. The Rehnquist Revolution did not reverse the New Deal. It only the effect of saying that was the outer bounds. Okay? And then Rehnquist does all of you a beloved service by trying to organize the jurisprudence into these three awesome categories. Those students love categories, right? These awesome, people love three things, right? Uh, where was I up to? Uh, yes. So uh, what, what, what's, the, what's the first category that, that, that Chief Justice Rehnquist identifies? Channels. Okay, what, what are these channels of commerce? Uh, about how, um, well, I think regulate the channels of commerce, how they travel things. Good, right, exactly. Channels means effectively roads, right? Th that's what, you know, it could also mean, I guess, rivers and lakes, but it means roads. This is the idea that people are driving on the interstate to get to the Hearts of Atlanta Motel. I don't know why that, that's flickering, I'm sorry. That's kind of distracting. So people can travel on the interstate highways because it relies on interstate uh, channels. Congress regulated. Cheryl, what's, what's the second category the Chief Justice identifies? Uh, is it uh, justified by, as a regulation, that Congress is thought to protect? I don't know the next part of that. What's the magic, what's the magic word there? What is it? <laughs> I, I don't know. Instrumentality? Instrumentality. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's okay. Well, okay, so we have, we have the, <laughs> cheating in class, instrumentalities of commerce, right? Okay. This is the Shreveport race case. And then and the Perez case, okay? Sure, well, I didn't spell even close. Shreveport, 
Okay, what does this mean? If you have certain tools which are used to promote commerce, for example, loan sharking, right? Trains. These are tools that can promote commerce. So even if that tool by itself never crosses state lines, like you know the Shreveport case, it was a it was a it was a railroad that only stayed in Louisiana, or the loan sharking. This is a loan that only existed in one state. So I'll turn up the flickering, right? Even if these tools never cross state lines, because they're tools of commerce that may one day cross state lines, Congress can regulate it. Everyone got that? Okay. And then what's number three, Amanda? Um, the yes. Activities that have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. And this is Jones and Lachlan Steele and Wickard. So right, th this is the wheat case. Even if you have a product, wheat, that stays within one state and one state only and never crosses the state lines. If that product in the aggregate has a substantial effect in interstate commerce, Congress can regulate it. Okay. Bless Justice Rehnquist for these three categories. It makes your life a little bit easier. That's why this is such a good case to actually read because it, it summarizes the uh, law fairly well. Okay? Everyone get those three categories. So Maria, which category does Mr. Lopez bring a gun to school fall into? Is it, is it number one? Why not? Um, well, what if someone drives across state lines and brings a gun to school? Ah. So that was very significant, right? If I wanted to apply the rational basis test, all I'd have to say is, well, someone can drive from Oklahoma to San Antonio and bring a gun, interstate commerce. How is that any different from saying, well, someone can drive from uh, South Carolina to Georgia and go to the hotel? Is there any difference between the two? No. Stuart, let's play imagination. How could, how could a gun be an instrumentality or a tool of commerce? Think about it. Just make something up. Be creative. How can a gun be a tool of commerce that you can make money off of? Yeah, you're a gun dealer. What if you're a hunter or a professional target shooter, right? Could it, couldn't a gun be a tool of commerce? Is that hard to believe? Right? Couldn't we say that people buying guns is like loan sharking, that when you buy a gun on the street, you're affecting crime in other states, organized crime? Is that is that so crazy? I want to see what I'm doing there. Jared, did the court here make stuff up to uphold the law? Was the court here willing to do what I just did and say, well, buying a gun might support organized crime, or someone might drive from Oklahoma to San Antonio and bring a gun? No, it was brought up. There were there were some ideas brought up about how um, it affects the economy by or commerce by uh, you know insurance rates and whatnot, but. Uh, why not? Why did the court not engage in this fanciful imagination, you know, Wonderland, you know, like Alice in Wonderland? Why is the court not making stuff up? Because it was so obvious that this wasn't about, it wasn't doing this, make, this wasn't about commerce. Was the Civil Rights Act about commerce or was it about racial desegregation? Well, there was a moral element to it. Ah. We mean moral elements. Well, they're doing things, I mean, using the Commerce Clause to kind of get, a, you know, a moral agenda. And remember I said the police power protects women, the health, safety, welfare, and morals welfare. of the people. What the government, the federal government's tried to do through the Commerce Clause, exactly what you said, was to engage their own police power. They want to protect the morals. They, don't, they want to eliminate the segregation, right? They, they want to eliminate segregation, right? They want to protect the safety of the people. They want to get rid of guns in schools. But the court here was not willing to engage, no matter what they said, in a rational basis question. 
they weren't willing to make up reasons why this law could be constitutional. I, I did it in two seconds. Someone drove from Louisiana to San Antonio with a gun, boom, in the substantial aggregate of a thousand people drove from Louisiana to San Antonio with a gun, that's interstate commerce. Or I'm pretty sure Mr. Lopez did not buy his gun legally. He was 18, so he wasn't allowed to, right? Mr. Lopez probably bought his gun illegally. Maybe it was stolen. Who knows? Right? His decision to buy a gun from whoever he bought it from probably inter, inter, uh, financed the interstate drug market, right? Drugs, guns, whatever. Commerce. But the court did not do that here. They said the only way your number, you're going to get commerce is number three. Is if Mr. Lopez and people individually bringing guns to school zones or by themselves, commerce. Now, a couple people in Montana have read this case very seriously. So you ever heard of the Liberty Gun Movement? This is actually Montana. You have a bunch of armsmiths in Montana who have built a gun out of elements only made within one state, meaning all the metal, all the wood, all the, all the lead, all the bullets. 100% of the gun is from within one state. And they argue that this, <laughs> this gun is not subject to federal regulation. Uh, they're probably going to lose. But I don't know if they should. Um, uh, so this case is being litigated as we speak, right? So we're in we're in number three, right? It's not up to say the gun might have crossed state lines. It's not up to say that the gun might be a tool of commerce. Does this have an impact in interstate commerce? And what's the answer to that, Thomas? No. Why not? Uh, well, they say that uh, they were to say this affects commerce, and they couldn't find any activity which wouldn't affect commerce. Congress Okay, good. So it's interesting, and I think your answer, your answer is exactly right. The court doesn't exactly say why this is not commerce, right? What they say is, if this is commerce, then there is no limit, right? They almost dodged the question, which is what exactly what happened to Obamacare. They didn't say this is not commerce. They said, well, if we let this be commerce, then anything's commerce. There's no limit. It'd be, you know, unlimited amount of, of jurisdictional power. And this is the main disagreement with the dissent, right? The dissent makes up lots of reasons why this might impact commerce. But what he's really saying is there is no limit, right? So the court, the court does go through some analysis. They say that Congress got lazy here, right? They got lazy. They didn't put this jurisdictional hook into it, right? But um, uh, 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 Marcus, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, one, 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 Melissa, uh, Mar uh, long, long night, Margaret. Does it matter though? Should it matter if Congress puts any limit here? Should it matter if Congress puts these magic words into the statute? Why should it matter if Congress chooses these words or not? Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I kind of feel like it does matter because they could have... How is this really any different from the wheat case and like what how, they came up with all these... How is it different? What changed? Well, the court is, uh, seems to be applying a different test, not the rational basis test. Yes. It changed, right? In Wickard, they made up all of these fanciful reasons why, well, maybe if Mr. Uh, you know, maybe if Mr. Filburn, Farmer Filburn, doesn't grow this wheat, it might make the price of wheat in, like, you know, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, like a, a penny more. Oh, and that's interstate commerce, right? But here, you have one dude, and by the way, this is a criminal law, not a state law. You have a guy who will be looking at jail time for a long time. I think he was probably convicted under state law, I'm guessing, afterwards. But, you know, he probably went to jail anyway. But you have a guy who's convicted who had really no connection to commerce. So Melissa's right. The court here was not applying a rational basis. And in fact, even more significantly, this is mentioned, they put the burden on the government. What do we mean they put the burden on the government? The government had to show why they had this power. And they mentioned this in the, in the, um, in the opinion. When uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist and Justice O'Connor asked the Solicitor General, a guy named Drew Days, what does the government put as their limits, right? What are the limits in the government's power? He wouldn't answer the question. He ignored it. He, does, he dived. He chanced around it, right? Why did he not answer this question? Well, here, here's a little 
insight, right? The government never likes to limit their power. Ever. Drones, Guantanamo, Korematsu, I don't care what the case is. Government doesn't like to limit their own power. So here, they were not willing to limit their power, and the court did it for them. All right? So let's turn now... Okay, so everyone gets the majority opinion, right? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Um, but if they're not overruling the previous cases, if they're applying a different test in this case, when are we uh, supposed to try rational basis work? Uh, welcome to the Supreme Court. So her question was, if they didn't overturn Wickard, which test are we applying, right? We are living in the year 2014. We look to the most recent cases to decide what the law is today, right? You'll study a couple more today, and you'll do Obamacare on Thursday. This is the reason why I ask you to test you at different points in time. That's the reason I ask the question the way I do, because I want you to know the doctrine. Today, we are governed by both Wickard and Lopez. Both. We'll do Raish in a few minutes to explain it. Yes? Uh, I'm a little confused about uh, you, you're saying that number one uh, doesn't work. The channels of uh, interstate commerce doesn't work because unlike parts, it wasn't a need. No, 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 no. Let me, let me say this more clearly. If you were applying rational basis, number one would work easily, right? If the same court that decided Wickard decided Lopez, like say, for example, Congress passed the Gun-Free School Zone Act in 1943, this case would have been upheld in five seconds. Easy. But the court changed. They changed the doctrine. They said, and this is actually one of the key phrases at the end about piling inferences, right? We're not going to let the government pile inference upon inference upon inference, right? So think about this, right? Lopez brings a gun to school. The gun scares some students. Because the students are scared, they can't learn as well. And because they don't learn as well, they don't get into good college. And because they don't get into a good college, they don't do so well economically, and they hurt the economy. And that affects commerce. Right? That's effectively what Justice Breyer argues in his dissent. If there are threats of guns in schools, education might be impeded, and if education is impeded, that affects commerce. That requires a lot of inferences. Like you assume if this happens, that happens. If you assume, if you assume this happens, that happens. The court will not let the piling of inference upon inference. And they say, at the end, we decline to proceed any further. In other words, we're going to stop here. We're going to say that there's a limit. Deal with it. We'll fix that later. Questions on that? So the concurring opinion of Justices Kennedy and O'Connor, who are uh, very much in favor of federalism, um, basically says that we've had a, a what they call a judicial struggle to define the scope of the commerce power. Mm -hmm. Right? And we have kind of went all over the place. So they acknowledge that there's a change in doctrine that perhaps the majority won't acknowledge. So they say, first, we want to have a stability in the, ju in the jurisprudence. We want to have stare decisis. Uh, Natasha, do you know what stare decisis is? Stare decisis. you got to know this word. Yes, yeah, stare decisis. It literally means stand by precedent, like, like stare you follow precedent, right? It's good when we have precedent because people know what the law is. When the Supreme Court radically changed the law, it frustrates people. It creates uncertainty, and this is not always a good thing. This is a point Justice Breyer made. Okay. So Justice Kennedy basically says, listen, we're not overturning these precedents. We're keeping the precedents as they are. We're just announcing a new limit on what Congress can do going forward. In other words, if they try to expand the power beyond that which we could have held, they can't do it. He says this statute has, quote, no commercial nexus. And simple possession of a gun is not a federal crime. He says there are certain things that are for state laws to decide. Criminal law, family law. By the way, does anyone know what, what a federal murder is? How is murder a federal crime? Manita, how is murder a federal crime? Say it again? How is, how is murder a federal crime?
Think about it. Okay, good. So if you kill a federal officer, right? For example, the Gabby Giffords um, uh, 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 shooting in Tucson, New Mexico, uh, Tucson, Arizona, uh, involved the uh, she, she didn't die, but she, she was a federal officer that was shot. Um, there was actually an episode of The Simpsons a couple years ago um, uh, where Sideshow Bob intended to commit the perfect crime. And there's, there was a, there's a place called Five Corners, which is a parody of the Four Corners, where you have five states that all border here. So he had this idea of firing a bullet across one jurisdiction to, <laughs> to him in another jurisdiction, right? That doesn't actually work. So, so a federal murder is actually quite dubious. It's unclear how that's even constitutional in most cases. Because unless you're shooting a federal officer or you're in a federal piece of property, it probably doesn't apply. But the criminal laws have expanded very broadly, such that many things, such as murder, can actually be prosecuted by the federal government. We, it's, it's, a weird, it's a weird system, but we have this now. Um, family law, too. Family law was once thought to be purely a matter of state law um, until we had the Defense of Marriage Act, which decided to uh, uh, incorporate federal law into state law. And now we're dealing with that as well. So the, the scope of what's state and what's federal um, is evolving even now. Um, you know, it's, it's a tricky issue. All right. The Justice Thomas concurring opinion um, introduces something that you may have heard of, but I don't know if you've ever been exposed to formally. It's a doctrine known as originalism. And what is originalism? It affects to understand, uh, it affects to get the original understanding of the text of the Constitution. Okay? What does this mean? The words in the Constitution had some sort of meaning. At the time they were drafted, words had understandings. For example, the word commerce, and Justice Thomas goes through this, meant intercourse or exchange of ideas or commercial products, right? It didn't mean agriculture. It didn't mean manufacturing, right? Manufacturing and agriculture were different from commerce. So Justice Thomas would say, listen, we have a Constitution. How do we know what commerce means? Let's look at how people who framed the Constitution understood the word commerce. And... He says that we've gone very far astray from what the Constitution originally says, that it only protects commerce. It doesn't protect this um, uh, uh, broad definition of anything that affects some sort of economic transaction. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit more about originalism when we do Heller and the Second Amendment and other cases, but the food for thought, um, are judges competent to decide questions of history? Right? They're not historians, they're, they're judges. And when judges start looking at the history, isn't it very easy to cherry pick and to find things that are conducive to their side? We can talk more about that later, but, but just to consider. Uh, the main principal dissent, though, okay? by the way, Justice Thomas is not a fan of stare decisis at all. Um, he would be willing to reverse most of the 20th century um, tomorrow. You know, it's, it's very unfortunate. People, Justice Thomas gets a bum rap. In fact, Jeffrey Tubin had this idiotic piece about him recently that said he was being disrespectful to the court by not answering questions. He's a very, very bright mind, and he is uh, extremely influential in, in his visions on originalism in the court. Um, and he often stands by himself here. He alone would be willing to reverse most of the 20th century and bring us back to a time before a wicker. Uh, but, but he is standing alone in that front. Okay. Um, Justice Stevens had a dissent where he argued that a gun is an article of commerce. You buy and sell a gun, and that's an easy issue, right? That's a piece of cake. The principal dissent, though, is by Justice Breyer. And um, just a, a, a note in reading Justice Breyer, he always has lists of things, but those lists are seldom very helpful. Um, so he's always going to have like, a lot of different factors to decide something, but the factors aren't very useful. So he... His opinion can be reduced down to the simple premise that having a gun near a school might impact education. Education might impact the economy. The economy impacts interstate commerce. That, that's his opinion in a nutshell. He's willing to think of various inferences of how a gun near a school can impact education. And what he says is absolutely true. I mean, you can imagine in a school with guns floating around, people are not going to learn quite as well. I think that, that's an absolutely true statement, right? But the question is how much will the court do this imagination game? Are they going to 
decide for themselves if Congress had any connection to commerce, or they're going to make up reasons after the fact. Breyer's opinion works because he says this is not the law of Wickard, right? This is not the law of Hearts of Atlanta Motel or Katzenbach. You have now changed the law quietly without telling anyone. Under Wickard, and I agree with this, the case will be held in five minutes. This would be an easy opinion under Wickard. But the court changed the law here. The majority, though, replies to Breyer and says, but wait a minute, Justice Breyer. If your opinion is taken seriously, there are no limits, right? If you can make up these inferences that, you know, gun in a school means education, education means economy, education means you know, whatever, commerce. If that is the methodology you apply, there are no limits. You now have an unprecedented and limited power, which is not what the Constitution permits. I almost just drank my barbecue sauce by accident, right? <laughs> That would not be good. So effectively, the difference between the majority and the dissent in Lopez comes down to how closely is the court scrutinizing what Congress does, right? Who bears the burden here? Does the government have the burden of showing that what they're doing is commerce? Or will the court just take the burden from them and make it up? With a rational basis test, if the court is able to make up a reason about why the government's acting constitutionally, it's really hard for the government to lose. Right? Because there's no rebuttal. You know, usually in a court of law, one side makes an argument, the other side replies. Okay? You go back and forth. But when the government makes up the rationale and you find out about it in the opinion after the case has been done has finished argument, you can't really challenge it. Right? You're fighting against a moving target. But what the court in Lopez was they did not accept that burden. They put the burden on the government to justify their actions. Everyone see that? Yes, yes ma'am. So how do you know if you're supposed to apply Lopez or Wickard? How do you know if you're supposed to... Ask me after you do Obamacare. Can you send that question for a few days? You're going to have to. <laughs> Because we're not done yet, folks, right? Lopez was 95. We are now in 2014. So what's the case that came next in 2000? United States versus Marston, right? This was something called the Violence Against Women Act, right? Who can vote against the Violence Against Women Act? Right? Who's for violence for women, right? I mean, these, these are these laws that if you name them something, you can't possibly oppose them on any ground. Like, who will vote against a Civil Rights Act? No one. You can't. Right? Who's going to actually be in favor? I'm for violence against women, right? So this is why I don't think laws should be named after victims at all, right? Laws should be named, give them numbers, because that way you can oppose on the merits. If you're named after a victim, you know, the Adam Walsh Child Protection Act, right? Who can oppose that, right? But you can't, so that's why I think laws should not be named. So what happened there? Congress tried to regulate a crime of domestic violence, and something domestic violence, or something which no one likes, historically had been something the states regulated. Every state in the country has laws protecting against violence against women, all 50 states. But Congress tried creating a special cause of action in federal court for violence against women. Okay? But what's interesting here is that Congress said the magic words. They said abracadabra commerce. Right? They put the word commerce into the findings. And to ignore Melissa's question for another minute, the court said, oh, but that's not enough. Even though Congress had made findings about commerce, it wasn't sufficient. That the prosecution of a violent crime is only the, the state's job, not the federal government. In other words, the feds can't interfere in the prosecution of, of, of these of state offenses. And again, they have the same kind of slippery slope, no limit argument. That if we allow the government to prosecute these crimes, there's nothing they can't do. They can prosecute rape and murder and battery and torts and anything else. The court held that gender-motivated crimes are not in any sense economic activity. In the same way that bringing a gun to school is not economic, violence with women is not economic. And it wasn't in the book, but Justice Breyer's dissent said, well, wait a minute. If you allow women to get beat up, 
They can't go to work, and they can't go to work. They can't engage in commerce. You're laughing, but this is just Breyer's dissent. And it's an absolutely true point. It's absolutely true that if women are getting abused, they're not going to be able to work, and if they're getting, not able to work, they picks commerce. But what's the fit, right? What's the connection between the actions sought to be prohibited and interstate commerce? What Lopez and Morrison represent is a shift in the court's thinking. They're contracting, they're shrinking the scope of what the federal government can do. They're shrinking that scope. Okay. Do I get that? Yes, ma'am. My question is just kind of what, what's the purpose behind this? I'm trying to enact this <coughs> law and make it. Who's purpose? Like, Congress? Right. I mean, do they not think that the states are doing yes. their job? Yes. Yes. Joe Biden. Joe Biden. This was Joe Biden's baby. In fact, he actually submitted a brief to the court in favor of it. Joe Biden wrote this law because he was afraid the states were not protecting women from violence. And by the way, the Violence Against Women Act is not only about violence against women. There are a lot of other provisions. For example, um, uh, uh, people who are abused can get uh, uh, immigration status. I mean, there's a lot of provisions of this law that, that are only tangentially related to violence against women. So there's a lot of things. But specifically, the federal government thought that the states were not prosecuting domestic violence strongly enough. And that they want to step, the feds step in, right? The feds want to step in and, and give a cause of action for it. Questions? All right, this brings us to, I think, the last case for today before we, uh, uh, before we break. So this, this is Angel Raish. Uh, who knows what she's holding? What kind of pipe? Yeah, a hash pipe, right? Okay. So Angel, <laughs> this, is, this is where I get the Texas vibe, right? So Angel, <laughs> Angel Raish is a, uh, uh, has a, an operable tumor. She lives in California, and under California law, medicinal marijuana is legal. Okay, this was nine, this was 2000. The case was 2005, but happened much earlier. So under California law, she could smoke marijuana. Under federal law, until the present moment, marijuana is illegal, right? And back then, the government would prosecute people who had marijuana. So she actually sued to challenge her conviction under the Controlled Substances Act. She said, it wasn't a conviction, she tried to challenge the Controlled Substances Act. She said, my marijuana is locally grown, right? It was grown on a farm in California and never left state lines. Here's actually a picture of her. She, she, she's quite ill. That picture is maybe not a missing picture. Uh, who knows what that thing is? Thank you. Yes, vaporizer, right? What's a vaporizer used for? <laughs> I love I, this is part of my book I always show this picture people always embarrassed by saying what that is yeah, it's a vaporizer right and it's used to inhale marijuana that's smoking it it's a little bit cleaner I guess right um, so she was quite ill so she challenged it saying this law cannot constitutionally be applied to me that my marijuana never crosses state lines never crosses state lines okay alright so uh, let's see Terry, what happens here? Uh, I think the majority of, of the, the statute. And okay. They, they based their decision on the Wickard. Uh, Good. Yeah, Wickard. Yeah. Why? How, how? And this is the, the 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 book gave you only a short segment. Let's think. So here, right? How is this case governed by Wickard? I don't know, what was the same issue about the uh, homegrown and not going out of states or affecting directly other states? Uh, Good. Okay. So, what did, uh, and, uh, and this is not really in the book, it's uh, they give only a short segment, but what did Wickard hold, right? Wickard said that even if you grow some sort of plant on your own farm and it never, ever, ever crosses state lines, right? If taken in the aggregate, it will have a substantial effect on interstate commerce, right? Or more precisely, it will have a substantial effect on the interstate market for wheat, right? If Wickard, I'm sorry, Philburn decides not to put his wheat in the market, it will affect the price of wheat in other states. Okay. So, Alexandra, how does this apply then 
We go from wheat to weed, right? Has I've said that joke way too many times. Or grain to ganja. I mean, I've done this before. Had, this is my laugh lines for the shtick. Right, so how does this apply? Okay, good. So in the first case, right, let's go back up. We have this, you know, Secretary of the Agriculture, Claude Wickard, has all these market signs discussing the, uh, the wheat market, right? So it's said there that the regulation will impact the interstate wheat market, right? Sergio, what is the interstate market at issue in Raish? You can... <laughs> Say it, yeah. Yes. So think about this, right? What the court held here is that the prohibition of marijuana is necessary to regulate the interstate marijuana market. The interstate marijuana market. Where is this market? <laughs> Silk Trail, I don't know. There is no such market, right? <laughs> Basically, what the court here said was, in order to make this regulation effective, we need to be able to regulate and prohibit marijuana. Because, right, right, right? If Angel Raish is growing her own marijuana, she's <laughs> reducing marijuana from the interstate market, and she's making marijuana more expensive for other people. Yeah. That's the argument. Yes. By Angel Raish growing her own local marijuana, it's local, right? She's not buying it on the interstate market, therefore creating an excess supply on the interstate market, affecting the price other people pay for pot. So they're trying to regulate the Yes. And this was Justice Scalia's concurring opinion. He said in order for Congress, and by the way, there's only a black market for marijuana. There was no market for marijuana, right? The only way for Congress to impact and regulate the black market for marijuana was to prevent people from growing it themselves. So it's not that her decision to grow her own pot had any effect in the state commerce. It's what her decision not to buy marijuana from a dealer did, right? So the government's effectively encouraging people to buy pot from dealers so they can regulate it. Yes, this this is marijuana. Okay. Uh, by the way, this this is actually a picture of Raish um, finding out that she lost her case in the phone. It was, it was actually quite uh, quite devastating. She's still alive, but um, uh, not not doing very well. Hmm? So we now have that Congress can regulate the interstate marijuana market. All right. This case was six three. Lopez was five four. So what changed? Justice Scalia and Kennedy changed their votes. They voted with the majority. Um, it is often called the war and drug exception to the Commerce Clause, uh, uh, but, but, but it does have some salience. Okay, the dissent was by Justice O'Connor, Rehnquist, and Thomas. And this said this gives Congress full power to regulate whatever they want. Okay. Let me give you a mini preview for Obamacare because we have a couple minutes. Okay. This, this will help your reading. I'm not going to talk about your reading for, for, for um, Wednesday. That's, self, that's more self-explanatory. So the Affordable Care Act, uh, any questions before I... Okay. So the way the Affordable Care Act works, okay, Obamacare, I'll say the Affordable Care Act, it's the same thing. The way the Affordable Care Act works is by trying to make health care more expensive for some people and less expensive for others. It tries to spread risks. So for most of you young people in this room, health care is relatively inexpensive. You're not going to go to a lot of doctors. You're not going to have a lot of bills. But for other people who are quite ill, they're going to have very high bills. So what the Affordable Care Act tries to do is to lower their costs of making things more expensive for you. This is how the law works. Okay? How does it make it more expensive for you? The primary way is by forcing people to buy health insurance. Okay? This is what's called the individual mandate. Okay? The Affordable Care Act says you shall, shall means must, you shall maintain insurance. And the goal is if all of you are buying insurance, you're effectively paying for a product you're not going to use much. right? You'll pay a monthly premium for something that you may never use until you get older or sicker. 
And all the money flowing to the insurance companies will then subsidize people who are more sick. Okay? And you can agree or disagree with this as a matter of policy. I don't really, I, we can have a debate another time. Okay? But what about the law's constitutionality? So it's kind of hard for you, and you're just taking combo now in the year 2014, is if I had asked you, right? Maybe I'll ask you now. Can Congress regulate 10% of the United States economy, a market like health insurance, right? Based on the case that we just studied now. Like, let's go back to the, uh, right, go back to the three things that Chief Justice Rehnquist, right? It would probably fit under all three, if, if, if you ask me, right? People travel on roads to buy health insurance, right? They travel to another state to go to a doctor, right? Healthcare involves different surgeries and scalpels and medicines that travel across state lines, right? Does activity, right, does an activity have a substantial effect in commerce? Well, yeah. If you don't buy health insurance, then you go to an emergency room, you're going to generate a significant bill that passes costs to others. Okay? So then why the heck was Obamacare even considered maybe not constitutional? And this is a fascinating story. I mean, it's subject to my book, but it, it's such a deeper story because it's a story of constitutional change. And it all focuses on one word that none of you probably even notice when you're reading it. But if you go back, you look at all the cases, Lopez, Morris, and Raich, they all speak of economic activity, right? Farmer Filburn's decision to grow wheat can be regulated. Angel Raich's decision to grow marijuana can be regulated, right? The decision to run a hotel can be regulated. The decision to run a restaurant can be regulated. All of these things are activities. Right? Even Mr. Lopez bringing a gun to school is an activity. Okay? So once some sort of economic activity has a substantial effect in state commerce, Melissa, it can be regulated. Right? But what if Congress is not regulating activity? They're regulating in activity. Congress is attempting not to regulate how someone's doing something, but they're trying to force them to do something. Okay? This was a unheard of argument in 2009. No, this, this was not an argument of constitutional law. No one ever thought about this until the Affordable Care Act was enacted. And the Affordable Care Act said you shall maintain insurance. It effectively told millions of Americans that you must buy a product, insurance. If you don't buy that product, you pay a penalty. So the argument went, and by the way, I, I, I drop all pretenses of objectivity here. I usually try, but I don't, I, 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 disclaimer, right? So the argument went, Congress here was regulating inactivity. They were forcing someone to engage in commercial activity. So this wasn't in one, two, or three. No. This was a fourth unprecedented category. Could Congress compel someone to engage in commercial activity? If Congress could compel someone to engage in commercial activity, then what is the limit? Is there a limit? Could Congress compel someone to purchase broccoli, because broccoli might make us all healthier. Could Congress compel someone to purchase a gym membership, because gym memberships might make us healthier? What can Congress not do under its commerce power? So we're going to build up to it. In fact, the class on Wednesday about the taxing power is a necessary uh, a building block for NFIB versus Abilius. But this will all build up for Thursday. So any questions? Awesome. Have a great day, everyone.